I'm Emily. Jake, two years older than me, is a science guy. He's living his childhood dream of a research job and seems fulfilled even though he's busy all day. Our son Mike is three years old. Just like Jake, he loves observing and experimenting. Right now, he's obsessed with the goldfish he caught at the fall festival. Our daughter Sarah is one year old. She loves to eat and her chubby white cheeks are just adorable. She's the comfort and joy of our household. Overall, life is pretty good for our ordinary family, except for one thing. Emily, what's for dinner tonight? Mother-in-law. Just as I was trying to calm down my crying daughter and finish up dinner, the doorbell rang. Without any hesitation, my mother-in-law walks into our home as she often does. It might not be the same day every week, but she shows up around this time frequently enough that Mike hardly even looks away from the TV. My goodness, fried food again? That's not good, so oily. You need to take better care of Jake's stomach when he comes home tired from work. It's not good for the grandkids either. But Mike really likes it. Well, that's because you only feed him junk. Look, I've made a creamy vegetable stew and minestrone for you. It's important for the kids to get used to Western food from an early age. <sighs> My mother-in-law starts setting the table with the large containers of creamy stew and minestrone she brought. It's a lot, enough to last for at least three days, and I feel a little down just looking at the stew, which is mostly just carrots and cabbage. Come on, stop daydreaming. I'll take the food you made home with me, so go ahead and pack it up. It's not tasty, but we can't waste food. This is routine. Last time she visited unexpectedly, she replaced my clam chowder with her own fried chicken. Holding the still warm container, she left without even looking at her grandchildren. Once the front door closed, my son turned to me softly. Grandma took my fried chicken again. My heart aches seeing my son's sad face. Don't worry, there's a little bit of meat left. Just wait a moment. Yay! As I heat up the oil again, I feel relieved seeing my son's joyful reaction to my words. However, my inner dissatisfaction remains. My mother-in-law has been overly intrusive since my marriage, but it's gotten worse over the last year. Every week, she shows up unannounced during dinner prep time. Initially, she would just criticize my cooking and parenting, then leave her cream stew on the counter. But for the past six months, she started taking my food home with her, effectively ruining our meal. I can't imagine my mother-in-law, who lives alone since my father-in-law passed away, eating all three servings. She's probably throwing it away. As I prepare baby food and distract the kids, I manage to cook. It's tough, but seeing my family's happy faces keeps me going. Yet, my fried chicken, braised pork, mapo tofu, and hamburgers, all of it gets taken away. I grew up in a family that ran a restaurant, and my dad taught me how to cook. So I'm confident in my culinary skills. And yes, I think my food tastes better than mother-in-law's overly sweet cream stew. It irks me to have my skills negated by her. But with Mike in the picture, I've been struggling to stand up to my mother-in-law, his grandma. More cream stew? Jake, who comes home after the kids have gone to sleep, makes a face when he sees dinner. Since only Mike's share of fried chicken was left, I served Jake a large platter of the cream stew. What can I do? It's what mother-in-law brings over. If you don't like it, you tell her. Yeah, I guess. Jake pokes at the stew, as non-committal as ever. She shows up without considering Sarah's nap time and even takes away Mike's favorite foods right in front of him. Well, she's lonely since dad died. That was two years ago. How much longer do I have to put up with this? Yeah, I guess. Ugh. Jake is usually reliable, but he avoids confrontation when mother-in-law is involved. 
Another pointless conversation goes by, and I let out a deep sigh. The only silver lining is that she hasn't suggested moving in. One day, tired of the same old routine, mother-in-law says something different when she drops by during dinner as usual. Emily, this Christmas everyone's gathering at our place. What? After your father passed away last year, we couldn't really do anything, right? We've been relying on relatives from Dad's side since the funeral, so I'm inviting them to our home as a way of saying thank you. Sounds exhausting. Responding with a lack of enthusiasm to my mother-in-law's arrogant tone, I wonder how she plans to host people suddenly when we've always gathered at her brother-in-law's or her own childhood home for Christmas and family reunions. She frowns at me, looking like she's dealing with someone of lesser intelligence. You're not just a bystander here, you'll be helping too. What? Come over on the 24th and help clean up. Stunned by the audacious decision, I try to quickly object. But Sarah is so young. Just use a baby carrier or something. That's how women used to do it back in the day. Maybe, but... You're also in charge of the full course Christmas meal. Don't you dare repackage store-bought food or cook anything that tastes bad. I don't want to be embarrassed. What? You can't be serious. I'm thinking of inviting your dad's relatives on one day and my sister's family and our daughter on another. It'll be a busy holiday. Although she's complaining, I can sense a happy aura coming from her. Hold on, the one who's going to be busy is me, not you. As the daughter-in-law of this family's eldest son, do your duty properly, okay? Having had her say, my satisfied mother-in-law leaves the meatloaf and heads out, leaving me stunned and my surprised son behind. She doesn't forget to pack the shrimp gratin that just needs to be baked, though. That night, when I tell Jake about it, he's as bewildered as I am. What? She's planning a party from Christmas, even inviting Dad's side of the family when he's not here? Yes, that's the plan. Well, maybe Mom's lonely. I finally lose my temper at Jake's predictable response. Think about what it's like for me, always being pushed around. Uh... Seeing Jake's face turn to an unmistakable uh-oh, he goes silent. But even he realizes that this time, it's too much, and lets out a resigned sigh. All right, I'll handle the cleaning and entertaining the relatives. Really? I'm glad to hear Jake's proposal. It gives me some direction. But can you still cook the full-course Christmas meal? Um... Just for this year, let's keep Mom's reputation intact. Plus, everyone in the family loves your cooking. As he pleads, Jake is staring at the meatloaf mother-in-law left for us. I mean, it's hard to say no after making a concession. Fine, just for this year. Thanks. Man, I can't wait for Emily's Christmas feast. Geez, you're in high spirits, aren't you? Being praised isn't so bad, and I don't mind cooking for people. So, I brace myself that it's just for this time and agree to prepare a full-course Christmas meal. When I tell my mother-in-law that Jake will stay over to help with cleaning, she makes a displeased face and says, How could you let the man of the house do such things? But she seemed reasonably satisfied seeing Jake bustle around at his parents' home for my sake. And then comes Christmas lunchtime. Emily, is the corn soup ready? I'm preparing the croutons now. I scurry around the kitchen, getting the carpaccio and corn soup ready. You're so inefficient. I'll bring the food myself. I'm sorry. If you're going to complain, try preparing a meal for 20 people. It's really, truly exhausting. Finally, the serving is done and I sit down at the party. Jake seems to have put our daughter down for a nap in another room. Preparing a full-course Christmas meal for 20 people was hard, but it feels good to see everyone enjoying my cooking. However, that good feeling lasts only a moment. This quiche looks so beautiful, it's like something you'd buy. Uh, thank you? Geez, you're good at flattery. 
This carrot slaw is perfectly balanced with the vinegar. The orange scent really freshens up your mouth. That's because Christmas meals tend to be rich, so I made it a bit more acidic. Something's off. Every time someone tries to compliment my Christmas cooking, mother-in-law interrupts. Something is not right. And the source of this awkwardness is revealed by Sophia, father-in-law's sister. Emily's mother-in-law is such a great cook, isn't she? Excuse me? Confused, I let out a dumbfounded sound. Unperturbed, Chatterbox Sophia continues her story. Did Olivia make this entire Christmas feast? That's amazing! Huh? I haven't cooked a full course Christmas meal in ages. I was going to leave it to my daughter-in-law, but she's absolutely terrible in the kitchen. And she never comes by, even when I offer to teach her. What? The mother-in-law talks about struggles she never even faced as if they're a given, leaving me puzzled. Oh, Emily, you should really take after Olivia while she's still well. Jake might miss the taste of home sometimes. You know, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. <laughs> Daniel, a relative hanging around Sophia, laughs. It feels like he's mocking me. You know, Olivia, that pork belly stew you made last time was delicious. It's amazing you can cook both Western and Japanese dishes. It's not that big of a deal, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. The mother-in-law smiles and feigns humility, but that pork belly stew was clearly my creation. As I stand there astonished, she mouths, go along with it. Apparently, she's been claiming all my dishes, including the Christmas feast, as her own and sharing them with the family. And now she wants me to be complicit in her lie? No way. Especially after she's been criticizing my cooking all this time. Though I want to speak out, I'm overwhelmed by the crowd and find myself speechless. My savior turns out to be my son. Mom, this omelet is really tasty. It looks different than usual, but your omelets are always good. My young son's high-pitched voice echoes through the room, and the noisy adults fall silent. Oh, Mike, this is actually a quiche your grandmother made. Sophia tries to cover for my son, probably out of kindness. But my son responds, astonished. Huh? But it's tasty. What? It's tasty, so it's got to be Mom's omelet. Grandma's omelet is super sweet and gritty. It doesn't taste good. My son passionately insists, gesticulating wildly, leaving the adults exchanging puzzled glances. Of course, the mother-in-law panics. Emily, don't teach the child to lie. Excuse me? Who's the one lying here? Mom, am I a liar? Mike looks up at me, his face full of insecurity. That's when I felt my blood boil. I was foolish. I don't care what people think of my mother-in-law or Jake. I've put up with her because she's Jake's mom and Mike's grandmother. But a grandmother who turns her grandson into a liar just to save face is nothing but evil. If she's going to make my child a liar, I'll become a demon if I have to. I took a deep breath and straightened my back. Mike is not a liar. The one lying here is you, Grandma. Huh? She must have never expected me to stand up to her. My mother-in-law looked shocked. I stood up and pointed at the table dramatically. I made this entire Christmas feast, including the corn soup. Everything from start to finish. What? Naturally, the room erupted. My flustered mother-in-law began to panic and yell, Wait, 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 Emily! You've been lying this whole time! Have you lost your mind? I'm not lying. Sophia, you said you got the pork belly stew from Grandma, right? Sophia, now pulled into this, looked up at me, surprised. Uh, yes, it was delicious. I made that too. Huh? You, you, you're terrible, stealing credit for Jake's mom's cooking and trying to set her up. You're the worst daughter-in-law. Then can you tell me the recipe for the pork belly stew, mother-in-law? What? Can you? Uh, well...
She hesitated. Then, as if struck by inspiration, she shouted, It's a secret! It's a secret family recipe, so I can't tell you in public. You don't have to give details or measurements, just the basics. Ah! Uh... Even the relatives who were disgusted by our petty fight started to see who was in the right. Emily, that's enough. My husband Jake had apparently finished putting our daughter to sleep. He had silently appeared near the door and restrained me with a stern voice and face. My mother-in-law clung to Jake as if he was her ally, looking like a tragic heroine. J Jake, what's up with your daughter-in-law? She's calling me a liar. That's awful. Mom, you're the awful one here. What? Mother-in-law's mouth drops open. This entire Christmas feast, Emily made it all day while taking care of the kids. Trying to take credit for it is pretty low. Jake! Sophia, the only thing Mom made is that massive bowl of creamy stew over there. Have you tried it? Huh? Um, yeah. Sophia, once again, caught in the middle, looks at the pointed out creamy stew, visibly shaken. Is she recalling how incredibly sweet that stew was? Yeah, it was insanely sweet, wasn't it? Mom thinks if it's sweet, it's tasty. She's always been so cautious about salt and oil, but uses sugar with no limits. So all her dishes taste like a block of sugar. Is that so? The pork belly stew was probably made by my daughter-in-law too. If you got any other dishes from mom recently, they were likely made by Emily. Really? Even that meatloaf? That was me. And the mapo tofu and shrimp gratin? That was me. Everyone in the family is disillusioned with mother-in-law because of her own son's revelation. Isn't that right, mom? Uh... Mother-in-law, exposed for all her lies, is panicking. Seems like she's given up on lying and is now trying to appeal to Jake's emotions. Why, why are you siding with your daughter-in-law? I'm your mom! I didn't want to have to say this either, Mom. I thought you were just lonely because Dad isn't here, so I've been having Emily put up with you. But this isn't anything but harassment towards her. There's no reason to protect you anymore. Don't see Emily or the kids ever again. Jake, who firmly dismisses his begging mother, starts to clean up the Christmas feast. Then he apologizes to the relatives. I'm sorry for the disturbance this Christmas. Emily, Mike, let's go. J Jake! As Jake takes Mike's hand and stands up, Mike glances at mother-in-law. Grandma, where's your I'm sorry? Huh? When you lie, you say I'm sorry. Then you get forgiven, right? Isn't that right, Mom? Um, uh... I get it. You have to be forgiving when it comes to raising kids. But a simple sorry isn't going to cut it. Luckily, I didn't have to worry for even a second. Mother-in-law clenched her lips so tightly they looked like they'd bleed, clearly having no intention of apologizing. Seeing her, Jake sighed as if he'd had enough. Grandma can't even say I'm sorry, and she's supposed to be an adult. How sad. Let's go home and have Mom's delicious Christmas feast. Okay. <sighs> we left behind a growling mother-in-law and confused relatives carrying our sleeping daughter and the Christmas feast as we left Mike's house. We went straight to my parents' place and served the Christmas feast. Everyone was delighted and ate with joy. This is what I had been striving for, so my heart was full. Jake, of course, apologized profusely and promised never to let us meet mother-in-law again. Apparently, the atmosphere at Mike's house remained awkward. His relatives dispersed, leaving only a soulless mother-in-law and some bland food. The next day, mother-in-law's sister and her husband, as well as Jake's sister, visited as promised. Seeing the bland food, they chuckled and said, Figures. Apparently, mother-in-law's lack of cooking skills was a well-known fact among her relatives. So you brag about hosting a Christmas feast? I wondered what magic trick you'd pull. 
probably just jealous of Emily, who's good at cooking and praised by Jake and Mike. Sorry for the inconvenience, they said. After hearing the details from Jake, my sister-in-law thanked me for my efforts. Sophia also called to apologize. I'm sorry for jumping to conclusions. It turns out Sophia also enjoys cooking, and we bonded over a recipe for braised pork belly. The misunderstanding with Jake was cleared up, and I found new friends who share my cooking hobby. I felt refreshed, enjoying a carefree Christmas. Of course, mother-in-law wasn't going to back down that easily, but I'm well prepared. As I'm making cornbread, my phone rings. It's mother-in-law. Excuse me, where are you? It's dinner time. Do your duty as a wife. Are you making the same mistake and coming over again? She's furious on the other end of the line. How dare you? I came here because you didn't apologize. Come home and clear the misunderstanding with our relatives. Then I'll forgive you for embarrassing me. No thanks. What? You'll be the one left out by the family. That won't be a problem. What? To begin with, the one who put on airs and got shunned by the relatives was mother-in-law. I've even made plans to cook with Sophia next time. What? Mother-in-law probably never imagined that I'd become close to father-in-law's side of the family. In other words, I'm well aware that mother-in-law has distanced herself from father-in-law's relatives. So, what now? Still got any moves left? I add another blow to the stunned mother-in-law. Also, I'm not returning to that house. What? Yes, the kids and I have been staying at my parents' house since Christmas. We're planning to find a new place to live now that the holidays are over. Initially, living near Mike's family was mother-in-law's strong insistence, but Jake's workplace is actually closer to my parents' house. Didn't Jake tell you to stay away from daughter-in-law? But since mother-in-law can't listen better than a child, we've decided to physically distance ourselves. Right now, Jake is the only one living there, and he'll leave once he's ready. What? Where, where, where are you? Who knows? You think you can get away with not cherishing Jake's mom? Yes, because Jake and sister-in-law have forgiven me, it's okay. Well, wait, what? Thank you for everything so far, mother-in-law. I'm so happy I'll never have to see you again. Goodbye. W wait a minute. With a bit of a laugh, I hang up on mother-in-law, who's screaming like a villain in a superhero show. Then I block her number to make sure I never have to hear her voice again. Two years later. Mom, what's for dinner today? Hamburgers. Yay! I love Mom's burgers the most in the world. Sarah loves them too! Sarah loves them too! Dad loves them the most in the universe. Aw, oh, Dad, that's not fair. My family happily waits for my cooking in the living room, playing around, as I fry the burgers in the kitchen. My heart warms up again today, watching them eagerly await my cooking, smiles on their faces. Speaking of, I wonder how much I've spent this month. Suddenly, when checking my credit card usage, an incredible amount showed up in the transaction history. Upon investigation, it was revealed that my husband had been lavishing gifts on his mistress. Taking advantage of my carefree nature, he used my credit card to shower his mistress with whatever she wanted. Cheating on another woman, using my credit card? You gotta be kidding me. I will get my revenge. Mark my words. My name is Catherine, 29 years old. Currently, I work as a freelancer. I've always disliked the idea of being an employee, so I chose the path of freelancing, where I could use my skills. I worked hard to get various certifications since I was in college. It was around that time that I met my husband, Bob. Bob and I went to the same college, and it seems he had always known about me. He fell for me while I was studying for my certifications in the college library. He asked me out many times, but I wanted to focus on my studies, so I kept turning him down throughout college. Still, he didn't give up, continued to woo me even after we started working, and eventually, I decided to date him. 
Afterward, I became a freelancer, and he started working for a regular company. After three years of working, we got married, and it was four years ago. And now, we lead a somewhat unique married life. Generally, I work from home, but since I was never good at housework, Bob and I shared the chores. Thankfully, I have been getting a lot of work assignments recently. When I was on tight deadlines, Bob would take care of almost all the housework. One day, while I was working in my room, there was a knock on the door, and Bob called out. Catherine, dinner's ready. Ah, thank you. I'll wrap up in a bit. Got it. I'll clean the bathroom while waiting for you to finish. Much appreciated. Thanks, Bob. It's no problem. You're the one earning for us. Let me at least do the chores during busy times. Okay, thank you. As my husband said, I do earn a considerable amount. Not to brag, but I earn more than triple what my husband does working for a regular company. So I cover most of our living expenses. If my husband pays for anything, it's the occasional dining out. I pay for everything from the apartment rent to utility bills. Friends who know about our lifestyle always exclaim, that's unbelievable. But I never really had any complaints because I don't have any material desires. I mostly save the money I earn. I work because I enjoy it, not because I want money. So I didn't really mind carrying most of the financial load. And I even felt grateful to my husband, who understood and supported my way of working. Then, one day, while I was working at home, a package arrived. The contents of the package addressed to me was a brand new computer. Given my line of work, a computer is indispensable. I immediately finished setting it up and started working with a renewed spirit. During a break, a thought crossed my mind. Speaking of which, how much did this computer cost again? I bought it last month and I've already thrown away the receipt. It's embarrassing, but I am quite a careless person and do not have a habit of keeping track of household expenses. I have no clue how much I'm spending each month. To check my card usage, I logged into my card company's app on my phone. Looking at the statement, which I hadn't done in several months, I thought, I'm not spending as much as I thought. This computer, by the way, was purchased with my main credit card. I have another credit card in my name, which is used for daily expenses and groceries, so my husband usually carries it around. I might as well check the usage of that card too. When I checked the statement on my phone, an unbelievable amount was displayed. What? $3,200? What the heck is this? The usage last month was a whopping $3,200. That's twice the price of the computer I bought. I quickly checked other months and found that between $2,000 and $4,000 had been charged in recent months. This can't just be from living expenses. To my surprise, most of the card usage was at high-end stores for women's items. I've never received any luxury brand items from my husband. I had never suspected my husband before, but this is too strange. No way. Is Bob? having an affair? The shocking reality made my head spin. Despite the shock, curiosity got the better of me, and I began to meticulously check each statement. Looking in more detail, I found charges from a travel booking site. He seemed to be booking frequently on the site, spending a considerable amount on accommodations. With a sinking feeling, I quickly checked the calendar. Sure enough, a few days after using the travel site, my husband was always going on business trips. I don't want to believe it, but with all this evidence, it's hard to dismiss it as a misunderstanding. How could this happen? Why? With a poker face, was he lavishing his mistress with my credit card? But I guess I loved my husband more than I thought. I just couldn't believe it, and I wanted to deny it somehow. This might just be him fronting the company's travel expenses. Maybe he bought something to surprise me and is hiding it. As I thought of these unlikely possibilities, I tried to deceive myself for a few days. At my wit's end, I needed reassurance and ended up checking his phone while he was asleep. Praying, I opened his messaging app, and sure enough, there was evidence of him getting along well with a woman who seemed to be his mistress. I'll buy anything for you. My workaholic wife is the one earning it, lol. Bob, you're the best. I want Louis Vuitton's new bag next. Of course I'll buy it for you. Looking forward to our trip next month, too. 
The inn we stayed at last time was great, but next time we're going abroad. I can't wait till next month. This time, we're going to take it easy and deepen our love. Just the two of us. The moment I finished reading everything, a surge of indignation consumed me. An array of disgusting remarks, unimaginable from my normally cool husband Bob, made me feel sick. By this time, my feelings towards Bob had shifted, from sadness to anger. A workaholic wife? That must be me he's talking about. A trip next month? Abroad? Just how much can a person ridicule someone else? I thought he understood my job, but in the end, he only saw me as his cash cow. Being taken for granted to this extent? It's unforgivable. If he's thinking that way, well, I have my own idea too. And so, I decided to take my revenge on them. While checking their vacation schedule, I started preparing for my revenge. A week later, to prevent my revenge from being discovered, I was living as ordinarily as possible. Sure enough, when Bob came back from work, he started the conversation with an apologetic look. Hey, I'm sorry for the sudden notice, but I have to go on a business trip abroad next month. Inside, I was thinking, gotcha. But I responded calmly. A business trip abroad? That's unusual. You've always been on domestic trips. Uh, well, our company is expanding its business overseas, too. Oh, really? That's impressive. Being chosen for such an important trip. Huh, well, yeah. Of course, Bob doesn't have the skills to do such an assignment. His company is a small general enterprise, and there's no way it's expanding overseas. As I watched Bob, he brought up this. Oh, by the way, I'm going to use your credit card for personal shopping during the trip. I see. I know it's tough to go abroad, but do your best on your trip. Thanks. Sorry, Catherine, but I'll need you to take care of the payments. At Bob's words, I just smiled without saying, okay, or I understand. Seeing my reaction, Bob also beamed at me. According to Bob, he doesn't know when the trip will end. He said he would notify me of the return schedule as soon as it was decided. I can't believe he can lie with such a straight face. Almost admiring it, I simply replied, understood, and we ended our conversation. The day of his trip, Bob put on his shoes at the entrance, looked at me, and said with a smile, I'm off. Are you really going? What's the matter, Catherine? Are you gonna miss me? It's not like that, but I wonder if you're really going. It's work, understand that. I'll buy you a souvenir. Insisting it's a business trip while actually it's vacation with mistress? And still, he was trying to lure me with a souvenir. To him, I coldly responded, Take care now. Bye-bye. At those words, my husband wore a curious expression, but ultimately said, I'm heading out, and left our home in high spirits. From there, I began hastily tidying up the house. I packed all my belongings into boxes and shipped them to my parents' place. I had already informed my parents that I was divorcing Bob and would be leaving this house. While my mom and dad were furious with Bob, akin to a roaring blaze, I explained to them that I had a plan for vengeance on my own and would hire a lawyer to collect the money he used on his mistress. In particular, my father seemed ready to vent his anger directly on my husband, but I persuaded him to keep a lid on it for now. A few hours later, I just landed, came a message from my husband. At that moment, I contacted the credit card company. I've lost my card and would like to halt its usage, I explained, and the procedure was completed promptly. Now my husband wouldn't be able to use his credit card during his trip abroad. His mistress, who was using him like an ATM, must be frustrated as hell. While imagining that, I received an international call from my husband, as expected. When I answered, he sounded frantic, demanding, What's going on? To his panic and question, I intentionally asked back in a puzzled tone. What do you mean? What's up? My card isn't working. Really now? What do you mean really now? Haven't you heard about any issues with it? Issues? It's bizarre. I was able to use it to buy my plane ticket. Annoyed, my husband complained, to which I calmly explained. It's not a glitch. I contacted the car company and had your card stopped. Wh what? Come on, Catherine. Quit joking around. Why would I joke about this? 
Clearly, your card isn't working. Isn't that obvious? Over the phone, my husband seemed bewildered for a moment, but quickly realized the gravity of the situation. He was so startled that he yelled at me with a volume I'd never heard before. Stop messing around! I told you I'd be using the card during my business trip, didn't I? Oh, did you mention something like that? Why the hell would you cancel it then? I can't pay for my accommodation or buy anything now. Yep, that's true. But did I say you could use it? Wah! You! Stop messing around! In the first place, why should I cover the expenses for your little affair? At those words, my husband was rendered speechless. He probably hadn't even considered that I was aware of his infidelity. Why? No, since when? He stammered, his voice shaking with confusion. To that, I cut in. Anyway, I'm divorcing you. What? D divorce You're joking, right? Why would I lie about it at this point? I can't be married to someone who cheats. No! Wait! I didn't mean- Whatever your intentions are, it doesn't matter. I've already hired a lawyer, so if you need to talk to me about anything, go through him. Goodbye. As I went to hang up, my husband cried out in desperation. Wait! Please! It seemed he had finally caught on an important fact. His voice shaking, he pleaded with me. What happens if the card is blocked? How am I supposed to get home? You finally realized? You mean, Catherine, you did it knowing all about it? Of course. Did you think I wasn't checking the credit card statements? No, no way. My husband's alarmed voice must have reached his companion because a woman's voice suddenly shrieks from the other end of the line. Hey, what's going on? And desperately, he was trying to calm her down. Just, just hang on a second. I'll sort this out. And how do you plan on doing that if we can't get back to Japan? You're going to take responsibility for this. You're totally useless. He seemed terrified at the idea of their relationship falling apart. With a pleading voice, he begged me for help. Please, Catherine! Please forgive me! Forgive you? Not a chance. Don't say that! Please! We won't be able to go back to Japan if things stay like this! You heard her, didn't you? Please! For my sake! Huh? For your sake? Wow, you've never pleaded like that for me. He prioritizes his own security and that of his mistress over an apology to me. I had lost all patience with him and let him have it with some cold, hard words. Why should I spend my money on you and your lover? It's ridiculous, however you look at it. But blocking my card is harsh. I'm overseas, you know. What am I supposed to do if I can't get back home? What about my job? Are you serious? Before we talk about your job, how about an I'm sorry? How much more do you plan to insult me? I'm not working for the likes of you, you scum. Catherine, please, calm down. Shut up. Just so you know, I won't forgive you, no matter what. I'll make you pay me back every penny you spent on her. I'll do whatever it takes to ruin you, understand? So just stay out of my life forever, you cheating piece of trash. I hung up without waiting for a reply blocked his number, and completely cut off all communication with him. Not long after, our divorce was finalized. He was initially resistant to the idea of divorce, but after a stern talk from his parents-in-law, he reluctantly agreed. I heard that after our call, he had a huge fight with his mistress at the airport. It turned out she had other men too, and she dumped him, getting money from her multiple suitors and returned to Japan alone. Left behind, my ex-husband had no choice but to contact his parents and have them deposit money into his credit card account so he could return home. Word of their affair spread quickly around the office as she also worked there. Did you hear? Those two were having an affair. He's married too. How could he do that? I heard she's been seeing many men. Seems like it. She moved on to another married man and dumped him just like that. I have no sympathy for him. As a result, his mistress, a temp worker, got her contract terminated, and Bob was moved to a less relevant position at work. His salary dropped as well, making it a total mess for him. No matter how this turns out, I'm determined to have both of them pay me what they owe me in full. 
Of course, I intend to recover all the money that Bob has spent so far. I won't hear any excuses for not being able to pay. I'll do whatever it takes to squeeze every last penny out of them. They can regret their carefree affair as much as they want. As for me, I've moved back to my parents' house, and I'm living with them now. Once the issue of the damages is settled, I plan to live comfortably by myself. From now on, I want to dedicate myself entirely to the work I love. Get up, now! I woke up to my husband screaming. Bleary-eyed, I sat up in bed, glancing around anxiously, thinking something had happened, but everything was silent. Huh? What's going on? Turning around, I saw my husband, who had been shouting, was still in a dream. Could it be sleep talking? My husband Liam often talks in his sleep. This wasn't the first time I've been awakened by his late night chatter. But today's words were a first, and I couldn't help but let out a wry laugh. What's this about? Get out? Then, as if responding to my words, my husband started to say something shocking. Upon hearing it, I trembled. Could this really be happening? That's how I, a woman who had spent 40 years with her husband until retirement, decided to get a divorce. My name is Fida, and I'm 63 years old. Liam and I have a son, but he moved out five years ago after getting married. We finished raising our child without any major incidents, and despite some ups and downs, I thought we were getting along pretty well as a couple. My husband is supposed to retire next month on his birthday. Back when we were in our 50s, we laugh and say things like, After retirement, let's move to a rural area in the mountains and try farming. We could ski all winter. Or, It'd be nice to travel around the U.S. in a camper van. But as retirement approached, those kinds of conversations stopped altogether. Of course, I didn't really want to ski all the time at this age, but we're still physically fit, and I thought it'd be nice to travel together. So, I was considering celebrating my husband's retirement by staying at a fancy inn we wouldn't normally go to, and I was in the middle of looking up various places online. But then... Get out, now! The words he said in response to my comments after that sleep talk were unbelievable. Emberlyn, my wife, has found out about the affair. It'll be bad if she comes. My soundly sleeping husband was gripping the blanket, groaning and moving his head. Emberlyn? The moment I heard that name, I started shaking with anger. If things go on like this, our plan will be ruined! His sleep talk continued. Is that so? Then I'll really ruin that plan for you. I'd been with him for 40 years, and I thought we were about to start a peaceful new chapter of our lives, but from that day on, I found myself heading in a direction I'd never thought of before. Divorce. The next morning, my husband woke up at his usual time and was eating the breakfast I'd prepare for him as if nothing was amiss. You were talking in your sleep more than usual last night. Really? I've been busy with work handovers and such. Maybe I'm stressed. You have to take care of your health to do a good job until the end. Yeah. He seemed to have no recollection of last night. I deliberately spoke to him in a softer tone than usual and unlike normal, I saw him off at the front door as he left for work. It's unusual for you to see me off. Well, your retirement is coming up soon, so every now and then... Right. I'm off then. I'll be working late today, but I'll be back by the last train. Then you won't need dinner. Yeah. My husband slammed the door shut. I locked the door from the inside and waited a while, making sure his footsteps were fading away. I wonder if he's really working overtime. Now I've got to hurry. I began searching the house for evidence of his affair. When I checked each pocket of my husband's suits in the closet, I found a crumpled piece of paper. I found it, just as I thought. It was clearly a suspicious hotel receipt. He probably paid in cash to avoid leaving a record with a card payment, but it's pointless if he doesn't dispose of it. There were several similar receipts, and the most recent one was dated two days ago. He said he was working overtime the day before yesterday, and he didn't come home until midnight. 
Since hearing his sleep talk last night, I was prepared for the infidelity, but when the evidence actually surfaced, I found myself crying without realizing it, shaking by the reality. Why? You said you'd broken up. I believed that. The truth is, my husband had cheated once before, ten years ago. I'm sorry, it was just a momentary lapse of judgment. Madam, we will never meet again. Please forgive us. When their affair was exposed, they apologized, prostrating themselves. Emberlyn, the woman he was cheating with, was a decade younger and a subordinate at work. Apparently, my husband had started to sympathize with Emberlyn, who was struggling with a divorce and raising a child. And while he was consulting with her, they somehow ended up in such a relationship. The affair came to light when my sister happened to see the two of them arm in arm, disappearing into a hotel district. Soon after, I heard that Emberlyn had quit her job and returned to the countryside, so I believed that their relationship had ended. Of course, there was a lingering resentment deep in my heart. However, at that time, our son, a senior in college, was job hunting, and I was worried that our divorce might affect him, so I endured it. There was also a part of me that was completely reassured that this man, who had been with me all this time, couldn't seriously abandon me and I kept telling myself that we could start over from now on. So, you've been deceiving me for ten years since then? My hand clutching the hotel receipt trembled violently. I will never forgive this. It's not just a divorce. Remember that. When I searched through his bag and drawers, I found brochures of inns I'd never been to and aquarium tickets, but they didn't prove that Emberlyn was the other woman. Oh, right. I pulled out a laptop that had been stored away in the closet. It was something my husband had bought a few years ago with the intention of starting a side business. However, after a while, he only played games on it, and once he realized that he could do that just fine on his phone, he stopped using it altogether. I'd borrowed it a few times, so I knew the password. As expected, the computer started up easily, and I opened up my husband's emails. Because he uses a free email service and had it set up so that he could check his emails from both his phone and his computer, I figured I could still see the contents of their exchanges, even though he doesn't use the computer anymore. Once I retire, I'll leave my wife and we can live together. Shockingly, that was what was indeed written in the emails he had sent. I've told my wife that I won't get much retirement money due to the recession, and she completely bought it, so let's use that money to buy an apartment. My husband works at a major company, and a few years ago he happily said, It seems like I'll get more than 260000 for my retirement money. That reminded me of how he recently started saying something different. The company's performance is deteriorating, and it seems like I won't get much retirement money. So, how much will you get? Maybe around 60000 at best. It wasn't his fault the company was doing poorly, and when he told me this with a dejected look on his face, I couldn't say anything more at the time. We have some savings, and adding our two pensions together wouldn't we be able to manage somehow? Ever since that day, I spent my days looking at the household accounts and punching numbers into a calculator. After my husband's retirement, we plan to go to the movies and eat out once a month, take a few trips a year, and so on. If we pared back our envisioned post-retirement life a bit, well, quite a bit, we'd probably be able to manage. I'll try to get more hours at my part-time job. I feel bad, but I guess my husband will have to work part-time while he's still healthy. What was all that worrying for? Does your wife really have no idea about us? Even if she finds out, she'll forgive me if I apologize. It was the same ten years ago. She believes we completely broke up then, so it's fine. <laughs> the email was filled with words that seemed to mock me. I'll get 260000 as retirement money, but I told my wife I'd only get 60000 So when we divorce, I'll just give her half of that, 30000 Thirty thousand should be more than enough for your wife. <laughs> On the day of my retirement, I'll hand her the divorce papers. Then we can start our new life in the apartment we bought yesterday. 
Seeing a heart symbol in the email of my soon-to-be 65-year-old husband made me feel sick. An apartment they bought yesterday? When I checked my husband's bank account online, I saw a transfer of $50,000 to a real estate agent the day before the email was sent, and there was hardly any money left. An already completed love nest? I'm astounded. My anger gradually turned into emptiness, and my mind began to clear. I'll grant your wish and divorce you, and I'll do it in a way that benefits me as much as possible. I continued to use the internet to search various things about divorce. Ah, I see. I can also get consolation money from the mistress. It seemed that the affair from 10 years ago was past its statute of limitations, but if it had continued since then, that's a different story. Come to think of it, I have it. I rummaged through the closet and pulled out the diary I had written 10 years ago. I turned the pages and found a piece of paper I had inserted at the date when the affair was exposed, just as I thought. After glancing through the contents and grinning, I immediately called the law firm I had been researching online. I was determined to accomplish everything without him noticing by his birthday, which is also his retirement date. A few days later, my husband came home unusually early and looked around the room. It seems like a lot of stuff is missing lately. I've been throwing out things we don't need. It's quite the trend now. I had already decided where to move after the divorce and had been gradually moving my stuff. I was inwardly panicked, thinking he might have noticed, but my husband, who seemed to have lost interest in me, didn't seem to understand anything. Hey, my mother wants to rebuild her house, so I've decided to help her with our savings. What? Of course, I've given all my savings to my mother. It can't be helped if it's still not enough. But we have our future life to consider, too. You're working part-time, so it should be fine. But then we'll have almost no savings left. It's okay, we'll get 60000 as retirement money. He's probably trying to decrease our shared property to minimize the amount he has to give me. But I never thought he would resort to such a petty tactic. Well, I was planning to take you to a fancy hot spring inn to celebrate your retirement. Huh? I don't need that. Why not? Well, it's pointless to travel with you at this point. I didn't miss the momentary look of discomfort on my husband's face. Of course, he wouldn't think of going on a trip with me, whom he plans to hand divorce papers to on his retirement day. After retiring, I was thinking about doing various things like traveling around just the two of us, skiing and so on. You know, it's what you were talking about before. As I deliberately spoke in a bright voice, my husband became even more sullen. What can you do? Are you saying we should live in luxury while my mother has to endure hardship? That's not what I'm saying. I just wanted to enjoy a peaceful time together after your retirement. My husband grimaced and fell silent. Up until recently, I was serious about that. But guess what? I don't want to go with you anymore either. Too bad. I bitterly muttered to myself inside my heart. Then came my husband's retirement day. I prepared a feast on the table and set off a cracker as soon as my husband walked into the room. In contrast to my beaming smile, my husband had a cold, mask-like expression on his face. Congratulations on your retirement. Let's get divorced. What? You're kidding. Having simulated this moment over and over in my head, I dramatically feigned shock and began to sob like an actress. I'm sorry, I'll give you half of the 60000 retirement allowance as a property settlement, so please forgive me. We don't have any other shared property. No, I don't want a divorce. I'm sorry. With that, my husband left the house. All that was left was a divorce paper with my husband's name already filled in. Well then, on to the next plan. As I promptly filled in my name on the divorce paper, I raised a toast and ate the feast alone. The next day, I was standing in front of a luxury apartment that my husband had reportedly bought with another woman. When I pressed the room number at the entrance, a woman's voice responded. You're Emberlyn, right? Liam's wife? Ah! The surprise in her voice was so unexpected that I had to stifle a laugh. Is your husband home? Could we come in? No way! Go home! You two don't have the right to refuse us. Huh? What do you mean? 
Who do you think the woman with me is? She's a lawyer. What? Would you prefer to discuss this right now or go to court? Through the monitor, my husband Liam appears and the two of them are having some sort of discussion. Do you want us to come in or continue talking here at the entrance? If we keep this up, all the neighbors will know about your wrongdoings. Are you okay with that? Fine, come in. And so I stormed into the love nest of my foolish husband and his mistress, accompanied by a lawyer. Once inside, my husband bombarded me with questions like, How did you find out? And, How did you investigate this place? But I ignored them all. Then, the lawyer next to me presented a divorce agreement to the two of them. Property division, $195,000. Consolation money, $195,000. A total of $390,000. What the hell is this? Seeing the contents, Liam and Emberlyn were left with their mouths agape. There's no way we have that much money. Why not? Retirement payment of $260,000, $80,000 given to your mom, and $50,000 for the down payment on this apartment. If you add it all up, it's exactly $390,000. Please pay promptly. I told you my company's retirement payment was only $60,000. It's too bad he tried to trick me. The lawyer has already contacted the company and investigated. All of this is shared marital property. The lawyer next to me nodded in agreement. Emberlin, we're also asking you for $50,000 in consolation money. I don't have money either. If you don't have money, you can't pay. Please forgive me, I'm begging you. Suddenly, my husband knelt down in apology and Emberlin did the same next to him. Do you think if you apologize to me, I'll forgive you that easily? Don't underestimate me. What do you think I've been doing for the past 40 years supporting you? The two of them, who had been looking down, hesitantly looked up at my unexpected ferocity. Do you want to sign the divorce agreement here and now? Or do you want to go to a court case you have no chance of winning? I'll let you choose. Going to court would be a hassle. It would take both time and money, but this consolation payment is outrageous. That's right, it's absurd. Oh, have you forgotten? I pulled out a sheet of paper from my bag. Pledge. We will never meet again. If we break this promise, we will accept any demands. It was that one piece of paper that had been tucked into my diary from ten years ago. During the first affair scandal, I had made it in a rush and had them both sign it. It says here you'll do anything. This kind of thing is invalid now. That's right. Then let's go to court. Well... Right, you haven't received your retirement money yet. If we're going to court, I'll make sure to contact the company so you can't spend the money freely. My husband was silent for a while, looking down, but after a moment he muttered, Understood, and raised his head. Good, now sign this. But 195000 for consolation money, that's just too much. Even I could see that. It's just over $4,850 per year for the 40 years I've supported you. You're saying even that's too much? I don't want to equate our 40 years of marriage to money, but if I don't say this much, I'm sure he wouldn't understand. Truth be told, the lawyer also said this amount was too high, but during the creation of the agreement, I was told I could ask for whatever I wanted, so I pushed for it. But can't you reduce the amount a bit? I need to live after this, and there's the mortgage for this apartment. If that's the case, why not sell the apartment? Of course, if you sell it now, it'll be a lot cheaper than the original price, so it'll be a loss. That's what I'm saying, so understand, please. Don't start acting sweet now. The only thing I understand is that you two will live a miserable life because you'll have no money. After saying what I wanted to say, I left the rest of the lawyer and left the room. In the end, the consolation money was reduced to $80,000. Still, they couldn't afford the mortgage and had to put the apartment up for sale but they couldn't get the price they wanted and ended up in heavy debt. My ex-husband had no choice but to start working day labor jobs and Emberlin started working at a bar. Even then, they didn't have enough money to live and were constantly fighting. I never thought I would start living alone at this age, but being able to use my time freely now is very comfortable. Lately, I've been into traveling all over the place by myself and I'm planning to go abroad in the future. There's still plenty of life left to enjoy Jessica, the call came just as I had settled down at a table in the concession area of the cinema. 
The familiar voice that suddenly came from behind made my heart jump. I was taken aback. I mean, I had just been thinking about him. Strange to run into you here. Wait, are you alone? Of course you are. Who would want to see a movie with an old hag like you? But isn't it a bit embarrassing to go to the movies by yourself? I guess when you get old, you stop being embarrassed about anything, huh? Well done. Well done to you. You haven't changed a bit, I muttered in my mind. He's still the same emotionally abusive man he was when we were dating. But I was somewhat relieved to find that he was alone. It would have been harder to take if he was with that girl and they both mocked me. But then... Well, look who it is. Hey, sis. Here she comes. Yep, that's her. My younger sister, Emily. Oh, Emily. Yeah, I ran into her just now. The face he made when talking to me changed drastically when he started talking to her. A smug grin creeping over his face. Then he compared Emily and me, sighing dramatically. I still can't believe you two are sisters. One's an old hag, the other is a young and beautiful woman. Age doesn't have anything to do with genes, idiot, I thought, but didn't say it out loud. I ignored him and turned my face away. Emily is a 28-year-old office worker, 12 years younger than me, who just turned 40. My youngest sister of three. She's young and glamorous. She was popular among men and was dating an incredibly handsome man who was a year older than her. But then, out of nowhere, she began seducing my ex-boyfriend, Ethan. Ethan, who was easily smitten by a young and beautiful woman, fell for her hard. And just like that, despite being on the verge of getting married, I was dumped. But to be honest, I was also somewhat relieved. From that time, there were already signs of emotional abuse. You're so damn ugly. Whenever Ethan saw a beautiful female celebrity on TV, he would compare me to her and dish out derogatory comments. He would use words like ugly, old hag, or fat. He had no filter. However, his lack of vocabulary, despite his tendency to spew insults, was so characteristic of him. Looking back now, he was a verbally abusive jerk with a poor vocabulary. When we first started dating, he was two years younger, so he occasionally called me an old lady. But he was usually kind and would say things like, Jessica, you're the only one for me. Or, I want to make you happy. So I thought that the occasional harsh words were his way of expressing affection in his own twisted way. How naive I was. About six months later, when old lady turned into old hag, I finally began to question his attitude. Hey, could you please stop calling me an old hag? I mustered up the courage to confront him shortly after he proposed to me. I thought it would be best to voice my concerns before we started living together. However, Ethan didn't understand my feelings at all. Huh? Why? Just the truth, isn't it? That's not the point. Nobody wants to be called an old hag. Common sense. He closed his eyes with an uncomfortable look and scratched his head irritably. Jeez, what a pain. It's only a pain because you're being so rude. So it's my fault now. You're the one who proposed to me, remember? We're supposed to spend the rest of our lives together, right? But with this, I can't handle it. If you can't handle it, then you shouldn't have said yes. But you said yes, so don't complain. With that, he turned his back and left the room. From then on, we had similar conversations over and over again. Ugh, you always complain about the same thing. It's just so annoying. I wish I was with a younger woman. Ethan started talking like that before long, and I started retaliating in kind. If you like younger women, why don't you marry one? But you can't, so you compromised with me. Am I wrong? Huh? I'm putting up with wanting younger women to marry you. 
and that's how you respond? That's why I'm saying you shouldn't have bothered marrying me if you're going to talk like that. Well, maybe I will then. After a heated argument, Ethan would always storm out of the room, slamming the door with a loud BAM. But by the time he returned home, he would always bring me a present, as if to make amends. Here, take this. What's this? In his hand, there was a bouquet. My favorite flowers. Sure, younger girls are cute, but if I were to marry, I'd choose a mature woman like you. I only want to live with you. When he said such words, the resolution in my heart to never forgive him would immediately unravel, and things would always return to the way they were. But everything changed when Emily, my little sister, began to make eyes at him. Even when Ethan and I fought, he stopped bringing presents. He would call me an old hag and ugly. I would retaliate, and we would end up fighting, with him storming out of the room. At first, he would return home sulking, and we would eat dinner together. But gradually, he started staying out more. And before I knew it, it became normal for me to spend the nights alone after a fight. And then, one day, just before our supposed marriage, Ethan broke up with me to marry Emily. This, I'm really sorry. Emily said so, seemingly unapologetic. Jess, you should snag yourself a nice young man and get back at them. That's what my brother Sam said when I explained the situation. He is 32 years old, the younger brother between Emily and me. He had long been fed up with Emily's selfish behavior and even now, he showed his anger openly. But there's no one like that. It's impossible. Don't worry, there's a good guy at my work. I'll introduce you. You just need to pretend to date him. But won't that be a bother for him? Not at all. He'll be more than willing. Why? Sam grinned. You'll understand in time. Plus, he's not just any man. He's the kind of guy who can punish not only Ethan, but Emily as well. I had no idea what he meant. Was he saying this man was exceptional? But why would such a person agree to pretend to be my boyfriend? Full of questions, I agreed to meet this man. He introduced himself as Jordan. Young, handsome, and to top it off, a sweet voice. Sam's words were on point. No, he was even more than a good guy. But something surprised me even more. He was the super handsome guy Emily dated before she took Ethan away from me. I'm sorry, that must have surprised you. Yeah, but why? As I asked, my imagination ran wild, and I felt as if I had already understood. Perhaps he also wanted to knock Emily off her high horse, I assumed. Jordan, he looked down, seemingly hesitant to answer. That's because... I can't say no to Sam. Got it. Anyway, thanks. No problem. And so, our pseudo-couple operation between Jordan and me kicked off. To get to know each other, we started meeting every now and then. From what he told me, he met Emily through Sam's introduction as well. It seems they went on several dates, but he couldn't get along with Emily, who likes to show off. So he broke up with her. I initially suspected their breakup was because Emily started to seduce Ethan, so this revelation was a bit surprising. But that wouldn't explain why he agreed to play the boyfriend role in our operation. What could this man be thinking? I pondered. But my time with him was calm and comforting regardless. Unlike Ethan, he never belittled me. About a week ago, he suggested, let's go watch a movie together next time. Today was a day off for both of us, so we came to the movie theater. As Jordan went to get some drinks, I sat on a chair, waiting. Just when I was thinking about how we're going to knock Ethan and Emily off their pedestals, that's exactly when I was approached by them. Ethan looked at me and said, Ugly. Old. And laughed joyously. Then, a few of his friends showed up. Hey Ethan, is that your ex? Yeah, just bumped into her. What a coincidence, huh? I mean, seeing her again, I realized how ugly she really is. Can't believe I dated someone like her. 
His friends chuckled uncomfortably, exchanging glances and peeking at me. Well, I guess you guys would be at a loss for words if you found yourself in such a situation. Ethan, you should apologize to your friends for putting them in such an awkward position. But he just keeps on talking, not paying any mind to their discomfort. I mean, really, dumping the old hag was the best decision I made. Emily's young, cute, and I'm not ashamed to show her off to my friends, so we can hang out like this. What's going on here? Interrupted from behind. Sweet, velvety voice. He came back at just the perfect moment. I turn around and give a small smile. Nah, just ran into an old acquaintance, was having a quick chat. Then my eyes quickly return to Ethan and his friend, my smile widening. I'm leaving now, my boyfriend is here. The eyes of Ethan and Emily widened in surprise. I thought you were... weren't you here alone? That's what you just assumed. I never said I was. I took a deep breath, gathering my courage, and then looked Ethan straight in the eyes. Ethan, thanks for breaking up with me. Huh? His eyebrows furrowed in confusion. I took this as a good sign and continued. In fact, I'm dating this guy right now and I'm super happy. He's younger, more handsome, and kinder than any boyfriend I've had before. His face turned a shade of crimson as he took this in. Emily next to him was twisting her beautiful face in discomfort. Their friends were covering their mouths or looking down to suppress their laughter. I then said, see ya, and turned my back to them, linking my arm with Jordan, who was holding our drinks. Take that, you verbally abusive jerk. Once we were out of their sight, I detached my arm from Jordan's. I'm sorry for dragging you into this, but thanks to you, I managed to get back at them. Thank you. No, not at all, he replied. Jordan suddenly became bashful, his gaze dropping. Actually, I should be thanking you. You pretending to be my girlfriend, saying you're happy. It made me really glad. Huh? I couldn't help but let out a surprised sound. I didn't understand what he was trying to say at all. He lifted his face, and our eyes met. I've liked you for a long time, Jessica. I was so surprised. I couldn't even make a sound. I could feel my eyes widening in disbelief. My mind was in a whirl. The only word I managed to say was, Why? Jordan averted his gaze again. Well, I broke up with Emily because I couldn't keep up with her selfishness. But more than that, I fell in love with you, Jessica. That was the bigger reason. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Yes, I've known him before our fake couple strategy. He was introduced to me as Emily's boyfriend, and we had met several times after that. It was likely Emily was flaunting her handsome boyfriend to me. I never thought it would lead to this, but I don't understand. Why would you fall for someone like me? He quickly looked up at me and vehemently exclaimed, What do you mean, someone like you? Jessica, you're an amazing woman. You gave me advice when I was unsure about where to take Emily on a date. When I accidentally cut myself, you immediately treated the wound. Remember when a kid nearby had a heat stroke? You were the first to act. You calmed down his mother while cooling him down and getting him something to drink. I've always thought you were a wonderful woman after seeing all that. But then, Jordan lowered his gaze. Emily seemed to have noticed my feelings, and after I broke up with her, she suddenly started flirting with Ethan, and even ruined a potential marriage because of that. I'm really sorry about that. That's why I was so glad I could help out this time. This surprised me even more. Who could have guessed Emily's seduction of Ethan was driven by jealousy towards me? She was young beautiful, and most of her life seemed like she was in the middle of a popularity peak. 
Yet, as I thought about it, maybe that's why she was so envious of me. Her pride, believing herself to be more attractive, was deeply wounded. From what I heard later, it seems that Jordan had been asking Sam for advice on various matters. It was Sam who suggested that it would be better to break up with Emily. And just as they were considering how to approach me, I just so happened to go and tell Sam about Ethan and Emily. For them, that must have been a golden opportunity. Afterwards, the relationship between Ethan and Emily deteriorated rapidly. Emily, out of spite towards me, got closer to Ethan. No wonder she is on the road to unhappiness, since she even married the abusive man because of such a thing. At first, Ethan, who had been kind with his words, soon began to show his true colors. His comments were along the lines of, The food is so bad I can't eat it. I don't like the way you clean. And, Don't you dare spend my hard-earned money when you can't even do housework properly. Fully embodying the abusive husband, and Emily frequently called our parents' home in tears. But of course, our parents know that she stole Ethan from me when we were about to get married. Every time she calls, they seem to scold her, saying it's her own fault. Emily, at her wit's end, appears to have started an affair. And I've seen her a few times, walking arm in arm, looking friendly with a man much younger than Ethan. Ethan seems to be bitterly embarrassed and laughed at behind his back after making a fool of himself in front of his friends at that cinema incident. It feels like that's being twisted in a strange way and projected onto Emily. She is probably having an affair in retaliation to her husband's abuse, and even showing off her affair by going out with her lover in public. The ex-girlfriend who was dumped by you horribly is dating a much younger hunk, and your wife is cheating on you. What a pathetic man. She must want to make everyone see Ethan in that light and laugh at him. Her actions are still as ruthless as ever. He has also gotten into heavy debt from stress, and the two of them have ended up in a constant state of fighting. Jordan and I officially started dating. From a pretend couple to real love, it's just like the trending stories these days. He is still kind and sincere, and he not only pays attention to my looks, but also appreciates the good in my personality. As for my looks, he even tells me, Jessica, you're beautiful. According to him, I have beautiful eyes, a cute smile, and I'm a fashionable adult woman who knows the hairstyles and clothes that suit me. His compliments might be a bit much, but his words have helped me regain the confidence that was stolen from me by Ethan. He even proposed to me a while ago, and we're currently preparing for our wedding. Of course, we will invite Ethan and Emily to the ceremony. They're family after all, and there's no helping it. I figure, why not let them have a good taste of regret, awkwardness, and unbearable embarrassment while we're at it. What do you think the time is? Where's my dinner? I'm sorry, but I did tell you this morning that I'd be late again due to work. You think I can remember every little thing like that? Ugh. I wish I could just ditch my old wife and marry a younger woman. Whenever my husband has a complaint, he jumps to the idea of getting rid of his old wife. Today, he is griping about a late dinner, even though I had told him that I'll be late because my part-time job is busy right now. He conveniently forgets his own forgetfulness. My name is Lissa. I've been married to Jimmy, who was frequenting my workplace for 13 years. What should have been a happy married life soured due to conflicts with father-in-law who lives nearby. Jimmy's philosophy of out with the old, in with the new all comes from father-in-law. Father-in-law regrets that mother-in-law was three years older and treats mother-in-law like an old lady every chance he gets. Father-in-law wanted Jimmy to marry a younger woman, 
and made a displeased face when he found out I was two years older at our first meeting. Why would you settle for leftovers? Think about it. But since father-in-law didn't like me, mother-in-law and sister-in-law were kind to me. Mother-in-law, who loves hot springs, was very pleased when I took her and sister-in-law to the spa. On a day off, I pretended to go to the spa with mother-in-law, but went straight to Home Depot instead. After shopping for various items, I U-turned home about an hour later. When I quietly unlocked the door, I heard water running in the bathroom. Apparently, Jimmy was in there. As I tiptoed down the hallway, I heard a woman's laughter from the bathroom. I knew it. I felt a cold chill run down my spine. Jimmy had brought a woman home, and they were together in the bathroom. Flashback, several hours earlier. Lissa, you're going to the spa with Mom tomorrow, right? Yeah, sorry. Shall we cancel tomorrow? No, it's fine. You haven't been in a while, so take your time. Enjoy some good food. He said, handing me a hundred dollar bill. Jimmy, who usually complained when I came back late from being with mother-in-law, unusually allowed me to return late and even gave me some spending money. Something was off. Could this be the phenomenon of when a husband cheats, he becomes kinder to his wife? Feeling guilty about cheating, a husband becomes excessively kind to his wife, giving her unusual gifts, which gives away the infidelity. Jimmy's next action confirmed my suspicions. I'm going to take a shower now. Jimmy briskly headed to the bathroom, even taking his mobile phone. Normally, Jimmy hated showers, calling them a hassle. He never went to the bathroom unless I nagged him. Afterwards, he'd wander around in just his underwear, refusing to dress, saying, It's my house. What's wrong with doing as I please? By the way, Jimmy never used his mobile phone to listen to music in the bathroom. So why would he take his phone into the bathroom? It meant either he had someone he wanted to contact immediately or didn't want me to see his phone. Both scenarios point to one fact. Jimmy is having an affair. Normally, I trust Jimmy, and as much as possible, even though we're married, I don't want to invade his privacy by looking into his mobile phone. However, if there's a possibility of infidelity, I cannot just overlook it. That's a fact. Late at night, I quietly woke up and sneakily opened Jimmy's mobile phone. The passcode was likely a combination of the numbers on the license plate of a car he used to own. Since his bank pin is the same, I roughly figured it out. Sure enough, the mobile phone opened easily. Then, picture after picture emerged, each featuring a young woman who looked at least 10 years younger and a middle-aged man with a receding hairline. I was amazed that such an older man like my husband could get attention from a young woman like her. And there were text messages between them, too. Who's this? Oh, the other party is Crystal. Got it. The most recent conversation revealed Jimmy's joyful voice and the reason for the extra allowance he had given me. Tomorrow? Wife will be out for sure. Yeah? So, as promised, can I come to your house? I'll be waiting. Then I'll wear the underwear you bought me last time. Will you undress me? Of course. In the bed you always share with your wife. Yes. The fact that Jimmy, who once loved me so much, was gone weighed heavily on my heart. That night, I cried quietly by myself. I swore, I will definitely take revenge. Now, I tiptoed to the door in front of the bathroom and locked it with a motorcycle theft prevention lock. The loud sound of the lock closing 
didn't seem to be noticed, as I had timed it with the commotion in the bathroom. I called my mother-in-law. Mother-in-law, Jimmy is indeed having an affair. I knew it. Melissa, I'm truly sorry. I'll be right there. Looking around the living room, I saw an unfamiliar female bag. I took out the mobile phone inside and found no passcode. In the phone book, I saw mom, but got no answer. Next was brother, so I called there. Hello, are you Crystal's brother? Who are you? I introduced myself and began to explain. Actually, at my house right now, Crystal is in the bathroom with my husband. What? Are you saying my sister Crystal is having an affair with your husband? I don't want to believe it, but it seems that way. What? My sister's kind and cares about our mother. Don't lie. His shouting was so loud that I had to hold the phone away from my ear as I continued. So I thought I'd ask you to come pick her up. I tried calling your mother, but she didn't answer. Why not see for yourself if I'm lying? I see. Mom didn't answer. Yes. Good. Mom is preparing for surgery and is in the hospital. Please, I'll come, but promise not to call Mom. I understand. If that's the situation, I promise. Thank you. I owe you one. After a while, the doorbell rang repeatedly. Then the sound of water coming from the bathroom quieted down. Who is it at this time? Is it a delivery? Jimmy, what are you doing? Giving up halfway? A conversation was overheard. Yes. I reacted to the doorbell and to the two people in the bathroom, the one surprised. Yikes. Lissa, why? Oh, your wife! With panicked voices, more splashing water could be heard. Then a loud noise of someone trying to open the bathroom door came through. Hey, what's going on? It won't open. Hey, let me out! I could imagine Jimmy's pathetic attempt to open the door naked, and I opened the front door laughing. <laughs> Father-in-law, mother-in-law, and sister-in-law's relatives were all gathered. Lissa, where's Jimmy? Is he still inside? Yes, I locked it tight. <laughs> Way to go! Yes, evidence is most important, I thought. Mom? Sister? A sound like dropping a heavy load was heard. It seemed that Jimmy had fallen over in surprise. Come on, this is not time to sit down. Mother-in-law screamed at the sight of the scattered clothes for two in the living room. What is this? Evidence number two. I'll collect it now. I picked up the woman's clothing and unlocked the bathroom. Inside were two pale-faced individuals wrapped in bath towels. Here's Crystal's clothes. Please come out once you've dressed. Hey, what about mine? Jimmy, this should be enough for you. Just underwear? Well, Jimmy, you always wear underwear only after a bath, don't you? After a while, the two seemed resigned and came out of the bathroom. Jimmy was in his underwear, and his wet hair was plastered thinly to his forehead. Lissa, I'm sorry. I'll grant you any wish. Please forgive me. A divorce will suffice. Don't rely on my money. What? But you said you don't need an older wife. A woman who scatters clothes all over the living room is no better than Lissa. Cheating is your own fault. You'll have to work daily jobs or whatever to earn the divorce settlement. No way, Dad. Just then, the doorbell rang, announcing a visitor. When I responded, Crystal screamed at the sight of the man on the monitor. My brother! I'm sorry, I called him. It's not fair to only Jimmy. He'll kill me! Oh, Crystal, are you okay? It's not me. It's Jimmy who's not okay. My brother is a former fighter. What? Opening the door, a tall man was already bowing deeply. 
I'm Mike, Crystal's brother. I apologize for the trouble my sister has caused you. No need to apologize, sir. Anyway, please come in. Excuse me, Crystal? Mike stood up. A muscular man who appeared to be six foot five feet tall. He walked into the living room and then looked straight at his sister with sharp, animal-like eyes. Crystal looked like she was about to cry. Crystal, did you really have an affair with this man? His sister nodded with a pale face. Mike slowly shifted his gaze to Jimmy, coming close enough that their noses almost touched. Jimmy was unable to even meet his eyes, frozen in terror by the intensity of Mike's gaze. You tricked and toyed with Crystal. Jimmy froze, unable to move. What's going on? Jimmy, who was firmly grabbed by the shoulders and couldn't escape, nodded his head like a broken doll. Mike laughed at himself, saying, Ha <laughs> ha! Oops, it's unprofessional to hit an amateur. And released Jimmy's shoulders, bowing his head deeply again. Listen, family, my sister has truly caused you trouble, but I still can't believe it, even hearing it from Crystal's mouth. My sister has had a crush on someone. Well, he's my disciple. If he was willing, I was planning to let them marry. Uh, with Mitch? Crystal's cheeks turned red and her eyes sparkled. Well, that's all ruined now. No way! Of course. You, trying to be happy by stealing someone else's happiness? What are you thinking, huh? Crystal shrank to half her size at the, at the loud, angry voice. Um, the mystery deepens. Crystal likes this Mitch guy, right? So, why with my balding brother? I'm not balding. Not yet. No, it's too late now. It's because... Jimmy said he would pay for my mother's surgery. Apparently, Crystal's mother needed expensive surgery, and she got involved with Jimmy because he dangled money in front of her. What? Just because it's for your mother? Infidelity with a married man is not acceptable. Haven't you learned from the pain? Eek! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Crystal apologized, rubbing her head on the floor. Jimmy, you have a good wife like Lissa, and you took advantage of Crystal's feelings for her parents. Hi, hi, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Jimmy apologized, his forehead nearly buried in the floor. But the thing with my mother was just the beginning, and I got hooked, too. I'm sorry. While keeping Mike, who had been apologizing all along, standing... I had an idea. Mother, about the compensation you said you'd give me? I'll have Jimmy pay for it. So if you'd like, use it for Crystal's mother's surgery. Oh yes, let's do that. No, no. Just the thought is enough. Don't underestimate my shop's income, Crystal. I picked up my packed carry-on bag and handed Jimmy the divorce papers. You're prepared? Huh? Yes, I prepared, all night crying, preparing to leave you. Lissa, I'm sorry. I left the house, leaving Jimmy three years later. A long line formed in front of the sign, Knockout Grill and Bar Number 2, opening today. Welcome. Oh, mother-in-law, sister-in-law, father-in-law, too. You all came, and thank you for the opening flowers. Lissa, congratulations on the opening, and this is a wedding gift. Mother-in-law handed over a bag filled with thick wads of cash. Oh, I can't accept this much. Why not? Just take it. Thank you. Mitch, come over here. Thank you for your kindness and for giving us a good deal on the rent for this place. Mitch's barbecue ribs are exceptional. It's a small thing compared to that. I thought that after the divorce, I wouldn't see mother-in-law and the others again, and felt lonely, 
but mother-in-law and the others still called me and invited me to the spa. The only thing that's changed is what's written on paper, they said. So I remained a spa buddy with mother-in-law and sister-in-law just like before. After learning about Mike's shop through Crystal's situation, and since father-in-law loved barbecue ribs, we became captivated by their deliciousness. When Mitch, who was training at Mike's shop, confessed to me, I initially refused since he was seven years younger. But surprisingly, father-in-law approved. Lissa, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Your calm and generous handling of Jimmy's affair was impressive. That's when you see the difference in people. There's nothing better than an older wife. I do wish you'd reconcile with Jimmy, but thinking of your happiness, isn't being with Mitch the best thing for you? And now, Mitch and I are married. And Mitch, who rented land from father-in-law, decided to open a shop there under a franchise agreement with Mike's shop. By the way, I don't know if Jimmy's affair was discovered by his company, but he was transferred to the Dallas branch and hasn't been able to return. Speaking of which, it's good that Mike's mother is doing well. How's Crystal? Mike is helping out today as well. She's transferred to Seoul, heartbroken. It's her own fault. <laughs> Crystal, who broke up with Jimmy, confessed to Mitch, but was rejected, saying, I have someone I like. Mitch asked me out right after that. Yes, it's really delicious. It's getting great reviews on social media, too. Thank you. It's all thanks to you. The time when Jimmy was cheating in the bathroom now seems like the lowest point in my life. Step by step, I built bonds with various people, and now I'm here. From now on, Mitch and I want to live happily by continuing to make delicious barbecue ribs, putting our hearts into each dish. On the day of our honeymoon departure, he presented divorce papers before me. I'm taking my whole family with me. If you don't like it, we'll get divorced. Fine, but I'm still single, you know. Huh? I screamed in my mind as he stood there dumbfounded. Take that. My name is Emma, 35 years old, and I work at a real estate company. I enjoy my work and find it fulfilling, and I have been fortunate to have supportive seniors and juniors. On the other hand, my personal life lacks any particular hobbies, and I have never had a boyfriend. I secretly felt anxious. My friends were getting married one after another, reaching their peak at 30. There are only a few of us who are still single. My juniors also left the company one after another, and each time it felt like a stab in the chest. That's when I met Brian through a friend's introduction. He was two years younger and had a smile that tickled my maternal instincts. He spoke few words and always listened to my opinion when making decisions. He always prioritized my thoughts. Never having any experience with men before, I quickly fell for Brian's personality. Our relationship developed smoothly. When I mentioned marriage, he responded, Then let's get married. When it comes to marriage, a dozen of decisions must be made. Wedding ceremony, honeymoon, and a new home to live in together. It's a once-in-a-lifetime major event, so I wanted to make decisions together. But no matter what we decided, he would always listen to my opinion. He wouldn't express his own opinion, just agreeing with me. Brian's personality felt a bit unreliable, and I started to feel dissatisfied with him. There is another thing that troubles me. It's my relationship with my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law's personality was completely different from Brian's easygoing nature. She doesn't listen to my opinions and immediately imposes her own ideas. Emma, when you get married, of course you'll quit your job and focus on taking care of the house, right? At your age, if you don't hurry, you won't be able to have children. Brian is working hard, so as a woman, you should focus on the family. It's the wife's duty to support her husband. When I went to greet her, these were the first words she directed at me. The husband works outside, and the wife takes care of the home. 
she still holds on to such old-fashioned ideas. The truth is, I earn more money than Brian. He doesn't seem to think much about it and has even told his parents about it. But his mother doesn't seem to like it. A woman who earns more than a man doesn't have any charm. Maybe you can't do any household chores, can you? A wife should be able to cook, do laundry, clean, and take care of her husband's health. Can you do that? My mother-in-law said, looking down on me. If it were Brian saying that, it would be one thing. But isn't it different when it's my mother-in-law? It's not something to brag about, but I can manage all household chores since I've been living alone for a long time. And I have no intention of quitting my job after marriage, and I want to prioritize myself as much as Brian. That's what I thought. But... Brian didn't help me even when my mother-in-law criticized me. Instead of refuting my mother-in-law, he nodded along with her statements. Because of that, I felt a bit uneasy about Brian. Can I really rely on someone like this for the rest of my life? Well, Brian is younger than me after all. Maybe he'll become more reliable in the future. If this marriage falls through, I might never get married in my life. Anxiety and desires clashed in my mind, swirling around in endless conflict. However, time doesn't wait even if I'm troubled. There are so many things I need to decide for the wedding, the destination for the honeymoon, applying for time off from work, and so on. The to-do list keeps piling up. With a sense of unease, I spent busy days preparing for both work and marriage. One day, I consulted Brian. I think, considering our work, we can only take a long vacation at this time, so is it okay to have the honeymoon during this period? Yeah, I think it's fine. Both Brian and I have similar quiet periods at work. If we want to take a long vacation, this is the only timing we have. The problem is the wedding. The venue I've always dreamed of is so popular that it's booked for over a year in advance. In that case, what about going on the honeymoon before the wedding? I looked it up and it seems some people do that. If we have the wedding first, it will be another two years before we can go on the trip. If you are okay with that, Emma, then I'm fine with it too. I thought Brian wouldn't object, but to agree so readily. At this rate, it seems like all my opinions will be accepted for the honeymoon destination, the menu for the wedding, and the decoration of the venue. I do have a desire for Brian to express his own opinions a little, but it's better than being opposed. So, whenever I found a moment, I continued to progress with the preparations for the honeymoon and the wedding. In the end, we decided to go to Europe for the honeymoon. I debated until the last minute between Hawaii and Europe, but Hawaii is close by, and I'm sure there will be another opportunity to go there. So, I chose to take a trip around Italy and France, experiencing the picturesque streets and delicious cuisine. I also wanted to explore the stylish accessories and maybe buy some commemorative tableware since it's the start of a new life. After considering various schedules and destinations, I completed the application about a month before the tour. By that time, I was completely excited. After all, it's my first overseas trip. It's impossible not to feel thrilled. My mind became filled with everything related to Europe, from buying the necessary items for the trip to planning our activities at the destination. Because of that, any dissatisfaction I had with Brian had completely disappeared. As the honeymoon approached one week away, Brian suddenly brought up a conversation. Emma, I have a favor to ask. A favor? That's unusual. I wonder what it could be. It's rare for Brian to ask me for something. Could it be about the trip? Did he find a place he wants to visit? What is it? What's wrong? I asked, filled with anticipation, and he innocently made the request. I want to go to Champs-Élysées when we're in Paris. Mom really wants to go there. What? My mother-in-law? Wait a minute, what do you mean? I couldn't catch up with this sudden situation, but Brian replied as if it were obvious. Huh? Since everyone is going, we'll all be together even during the trip, right? 
What do you mean by everyone? It's a honeymoon, so it's obvious that it's just me and you, the two of us going. But my mom thinks it's normal for the whole family to go. First of all, I only made reservations for two people, you and me, Brian. The tour deadline was seven days ago, so today is the last day to register. Regardless of whether we go together or not, I only booked for two people, so there's no way we can go. If you ask the travel agency, they can figure something out. As I was dumbfounded by his statement, the intercom in the house rang. On the intercom screen, I saw the figure of my in-laws. Without caring about my surprise, my in-laws entered the house, carrying a large number of bags. Ignoring my objections, my mother-in-law's eyes sparkled as she announced, I thought I'd leave the luggage here, since we are leaving soon. I'm so excited. Then Brian said, Just leave the luggage here, and started leading my in-laws into the room without my consent. Wait a minute! I tried to stop him in a hurry, but my mother-in-law stared at me sharply. Oh, what is it, Emma? I hope you're not suddenly saying, I don't want to go together now. I, I didn't agree to go together in the first place. I immediately retorted, but my mother-in-law paid no attention, saying, You heard it just now, didn't you? But Brian always thought we would go together with you, right? In response to my mother-in-law's flattering question, Brian replied with a simple, Yeah. Taking advantage of his affirmation, my mother-in-law began to deny me. It's normal for the husband's parents to go on the honeymoon. Don't you have such common sense? I hope you won't have any unpleasant experiences during the trip being with you. Since it's a special honeymoon, we want to make good memories, right? I'll make sure to drill common sense into you during this week before we go on the trip. It's supposed to be a special honeymoon? Drilling common sense into me? It felt like everything was being ruined. I clearly felt my blood boiling. Mother-in-law, this is a honeymoon, you know? Normally, it's supposed to be just the husband and wife going, right? I desperately held my ground. If I continued to listen to my mother-in-law's side, it would affect the future. I wanted to avoid that at all costs. However, my mother-in-law stubbornly refused to compromise. Not only that, she started to deny me. The husband's parents are supposed to go on the honeymoon together. It's just common sense. I can't believe you dislike being with us. I thought we would become a family, but our common sense is different. You don't like me and nothing seems to match. How sad. As if she had been hurt herself, my mother-in-law lowered her eyebrows in an artificial manner. The end of her words, how sad, contained an underlying smirk. I was convinced that she was deliberately trying to trap me. That's how certain I was. Even Brian, without questioning, began to blame me based on my mother-in-law's words. Emma! What the hell? They're my parents. It's okay to go on a honeymoon together, isn't it? It's impossible. We've already made the reservations for two people. Besides, I've never heard of families accompanying a honeymoon trip. I declared, and Brian shouted angrily, as if picking a fight. I never thought you hated my parents so much, Emma. That's it. Just leave for today. He looked at me as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. As Brian spoke, a wicked smile formed on my mother-in-law's face. Why does he always take his mother's side without listening to his spouse's opinion? Especially at a time like this, I wanted him to support my views. Before I could even react to his words, I found myself pushed out to the entrance. Just before the door closed, I caught a glimpse of my mother-in-law's smug expression. I was left outside, unable to do anything but stand there. Why am I being treated like the bad guy? Why does everything have to be ruined, including this precious trip? Frustration and sadness overwhelmed me, and tears began to flow. A few hours later, I received a message from Brian. I want you to see if it's still possible for them to join the tour. If not, we'll cancel this trip and apply for a tour where all four of us can go. Please think rationally. If you reconsider, we can figure it out properly. I don't think I'm in the wrong, so I have no reason to apologize or respond. Brian must be angry too, because there was no contact after that message. 
Time passed and the day of our honeymoon departure finally arrived. I couldn't imagine enjoying it in the state, but we had been preparing for this honeymoon for a month. I couldn't refuse. As I prepared to leave the house with a heavy heart, the intercom rang. Brian had come to pick me up. We hadn't seen each other since that incident, so I didn't know what kind of face to put on. The fact that he came to pick me up meant that he still intended to go on the trip, but he didn't have a single suitcase with him. Instead, he handed me a divorce paper. After hurting my parents, you still intended to go on this trip, didn't you? I'm taking my entire family on this honeymoon. If you don't like it, let's get a divorce. My mom said it would be better that way. Saying that, he thrust the divorce paper in front of me. In that moment, I finally realized what kind of person he was. I thought he would listen to my opinions and prioritize me. That he was kind. But that wasn't the case. This man is just someone without his own opinions. And he prioritizes his family over me. That's Brian. As I came to that realization, I felt my feelings for him cooling down. Even if I were to marry him, I couldn't see myself overcoming the many challenges that awaited us in the future. And becoming a family with that mother-in-law, it was an impossible scenario. Determined, I pointed at the divorce paper in front of me and said, Sure, but I'm still single, you know. Huh? Brian exclaimed, clearly surprised by my words. Single? What do you mean? Weren't you listening? We talked about going on the honeymoon, but delaying the registration until the day of the ceremony. I made sure to get your permission, Brian, you know. You didn't forget, did you? The marriage certificate is still in the drawer, and you even said, If you are fine with it, Emma, then I'm fine too. That's right, divorce or not, we're not even married yet. There's no problem with going on the honeymoon with my maiden name. Perhaps you remembered my words as Brian's expression suddenly changed. But immediately, he turned red and raised his voice in frustration. Are you out of your mind to give up on marriage just because of a honeymoon? Get a grip! I responded, matching Brian's intensity with my own strong voice. This is the result of me being rational. I've been so desperate to get married that I couldn't see reality clearly. I don't think I can be happy marrying someone who doesn't listen to the opinions of their future spouse and doesn't support them. I'd rather stay single for life. Thanks for making me think that way. Haste makes waste. I keenly felt that this saying was true. Hey, Emma, let's calm down and start over from scratch, okay? He looked like he was about to cry. His pleading voice trembled. But I won't be fooled anymore. I will break free from this guy. Without realizing it, I found myself shouting loudly at Brian. If you're so desperate for a family trip, why don't you go with your family of three? But in return, you'll have to plan everything, from the tour reservations to the itinerary all by yourself. After always relying on others, it's about time you experience the difficulty yourself. If you think you can handle it, go ahead, you indecisive man. I pulled out the marriage certificate from the drawer and tore it to shreds in front of Brian. In response to the sudden turn of events, his mouth was left hanging open. Overwhelmed by my determination, Brian was completely taken aback. Well, do you understand how serious I am now? I refuse to have a future that's pitch black. It's over between you and me. Why don't you hurry back to your beloved mommy and cry to her, you mama's boy. Leaving a dumbfounded Brian behind, I slammed the front door shut. Given his state, he might actually go cry to his mother. I could easily imagine him doing that. Afterward, I contacted the tour company to cancel our reservations. Since it was a same-day cancellation, we were charged 100% of the cancellation fee. I billed Brian for the entire fee since he was the one who ruined our honeymoon. It was the natural outcome. Later, Brian blamed me for the failed marriage and spread rumors about it to those around us. However, it seemed that no one sympathized with him among our relatives and co-workers. Instead, he started to be seen as an unconventional mama's boy due to his past actions and was disliked by many. When I told my parents about the divorce, they were initially surprised but quickly accepted it. 
Marriage isn't the only source of happiness. As long as you're happy, Emma, that's what matters. I couldn't be more grateful for my mother's words. As a side note, since then, my hobby has become traveling. I felt it would be a waste to let long vacations go to waste, so I embarked on my first solo trip. Going overseas was a bit difficult, but I enjoyed a relaxing time in historic cities I had always wanted to visit. Wow, being alone is actually quite enjoyable. Thanks to that historical adventure trip, I've started to fully enjoy solo traveling whenever I have time off. On my next break, I'm planning to embark on my next overseas trip. I've begun a life where I won't let myself be controlled by marriage alone.